Yes, that is right. Buy and hold strategy doesn't work. Do you want to know why? Let's find out together. Hi, if you're new to the channel, my name is Tay from Financial Tortoise, where we learn to grow our wealth slow and steady. The buy and hold strategy is an idea that if you buy an investment and hold on to it for a long period of time, you will make money in the long run, especially if you're buying low cost, broad market index funds. The market will have its ups and downs. It will make a lot of noise. However, if you consistently buy and hold for a long period of time, your investment will grow and so will your wealth. However, there is a simple flaw to this strategy that too many of us overlook. Us. Buy and hold strategy doesn't work because we get in our own way. Normal human beings are far from fully rational and stock market investors are no different. Just think of all the people that we know. Our friends, coworkers, supervisors, our kids. Do any of us act rationally? Of course not. We know we shouldn't eat that third Twinkie because it could lead to diabetes and diabetes will kill us one day. I know this because that is what my doctor told me. But I'm an irrational being. But I succumb to my temptation and I eat that Twinkie. Buy and hold strategy is an excellent strategy to grow our wealth. But when we keep getting in our way, we prevent it from working its magic. Let me talk about four common behavioral finance principles that keeps us from winning with this strategy. The number one bias that gets in the way of buy and hold strategy is overconfidence. Our tendency to be overconfident about our beliefs and abilities and overly optimistic about assessment of the future. Let's consider our own assessment of our driving skills to highlight this bias of overconfidence. Driving a car clearly requires some level of skill to do well. We don't just let anybody drive a thousand pound machine 70 miles per hour down a speeding highway. You have to pass a written test, a hands-on driver's test, and wait three hours in line at the DMV to earn this privilege. And even after all these tests, not everyone can be an excellent driver. Based on statistics, half of us are better than average, and half of us are worse than average. And there are a small percentage of really excellent drivers, and a similar small percentage of really horrible drivers. It is a basic bell curve. However, how do you think an average person would answer if asked about their driving skills? Do we objectively know where we stand on the bell curve? To answer this question, there was an experiment that asked a group of individuals their competence as drivers in relation to everyone else who drives a car. As you can guess at this point, about 80 to 90% of the respondents said they were more skillful, safer drivers than others on the road. What these kind of studies show is that most people consider themselves above average, when the reality is that this isn't true for most people. I do this constantly in order to not fall into a depressive mood. I have to constantly tell myself that my YouTube videos are above average because the truth hurts too much. Imagine how this overconfidence plays out in the investment world. When we think we're better than average, many people mistakenly convince themselves that they can beat the market. Just like Warren Buffett, just like Peter Lynch. I'm a fairly smart person, so if I read enough news and company financials, I can control the outcome. I can identify winning stocks and make millions overnight. This kind of overconfidence leads us to speculate more than we should, and as a result, we trade too much. Trying to dance in and out of the market buying low and selling high. Unfortunately, studies have shown that the more individuals traded, the worse he or she did. Buy and hold only works when as the strategy states, we buy and actually hold for a long period of time without tinkering with our investments. But overconfidence can get in the way of the strategy and sabotage our future wealth. The number two bias that gets in the way of buy and hold strategy is bias judgment. Psychologists have long identified a tendency for individuals to be fooled by the illusion that we have some control over situations we are in, in fact, when none exists. In one study, subjects were seated in front of a computer screen divided by a horizontal line with a ball fluctuating randomly between the two halves. Then people were given a device to press to move the ball upward, but they were warned that random shocks would also influence the ball so that they did not have complete control. Subjects then were asked to play a game with the object of keeping the ball in the upper half of the screen as long as possible. In one set of experiments, the device was not even connected to the computer, so the player had absolutely no control over the movement of the ball. Nevertheless, when subjects were questioned after a period of playing the game, they were convinced that they had a good deal of control over the movement of the ball. Remember, some of the device wasn't even connected to the computer, so their activity had absolutely no influence on the outcome of the game. Yet, people believed that they did. Bias judgment. In the same way, this illusion of control often leads investors to see trends that do not exist or to believe that they can spot a stock price pattern that will predict future prices. The truth is that despite considerable effort to glean some form of predictability out of stock data, the fluctuation of stock price is oftentimes close to random rather than predictable logic. Price changes in the future are essentially unrelated to changes in the past. They move because of the latest gossip or because of fear or even manipulation by a group of stock investors. The reality is that it's impossible to predict. This bias judgment, the illusion that we have some control over situations where none exists, accounts for investors to chase hot funds 
or extrapolate things they think they see from recent events. If we want to win with buy and hold investing strategy, we have to be careful to check our own bias. We have much less control than we think, especially when it comes to the market. So the best strategy is to really trust the process and not to do anything but be patient in times of market volatility. The number three bias that gets in the way of buy and hold strategy is herd mentality. Have you ever seen a study where a single person stood on a street corner and looked up at an empty sky for a long period of time? Initially, a small percentage of people on the street would stop to see what the person was looking at, but most would simply walk past. But when about five or so people started to look up at the sky, more people would stop to gaze at the empty sky as well. And when this number grew to about 15 or more people, more than half the people walking by would stop and look up. Higher the number of people looking skyward, more people would stop to look up. This simply is the herd mentality, and I'm sure many of us have done the same thing without having thought about it twice. You saw a crowd of people gathering up for something, and before you know it, you're part of the crowd. The internet bubble of 1999 and early 2000 period provides a classic example of herd mentality in the investment world. Individual investors were excited by the prospects of huge gains from stocks catering to the internet economy and got infected with the herd mentality. People everywhere were talking about how great wealth was being created by the growth of the internet, and if you didn't want to be left behind, you had to get into the action now. Individual investors and even institutional investors were purchasing internet stocks for no other reason than prices were rising and other people were making money. Even when the company had no income, no business plan, or a viable product. Just the fact that they had a .com at the end of their company name made them a prime target for investments. And just when we thought we all learned a good lesson, the same thing happened during the US housing bubble of 2008 and 2009. In the years leading up to the housing crisis, fueled by easy credit, housing prices began to rise rapidly. The initial rise in prices encouraged even more buyers. Everyone was talking about how they were making tons of money through real estate because house prices kept going up. Many, fueled by the herd mentality and the greed to get rich overnight, were flipping houses to make quick dollars. We know how both the internet bubble and the housing bubble ended. Not very well for all that followed the herd. A key way to win with a buy and hold strategy is not to get swept up by the herd mentality. Herd mentality can easily drive up the market artificially, and it's an easy way to get blinded by greed. As Warren Buffett famously said, be fearful when others are greedy, and be greedy when others are fearful. The number four bias that gets in the way of buy and hold strategy is loss aversion. Loss aversion is a cognitive bias that describes the pain of losing is psychologically twice as powerful as the pleasure of gaining, even when the scale of loss or gain is identical. For example, let's say that you're told that a fair coin will be flipped, and that if it comes up heads, you will give in $100. However, if the coin comes up tails, you must pay $100. Would you accept such a gamble? Most people would actually say no, even though the gamble is a fair one in the sense that in a repeated trial, you would end up even. Half the time you would gain $100, and the other half the time you would lose $100. Psychologically, we have a harder time digesting the loss of $100, despite the same probability that we could make $100. This reluctance to take losses is non-optimal when it comes to our investments. Risk is a necessary cost to investing in the market. Risk comes with a lot of volatility, a lot of ups and downs. And this is the price that you have to pay if you want to play in the market and have a chance of growing your net worth. However, people who are very prone to risk aversion might prefer to avoid risk altogether, leading to overly conservative portfolios that do not deliver the returns they need to achieve their goals. When it comes to investing, a general rule of thumb you want to understand is the relationship between risk and reward and how it correlates to stocks and bonds. If you want to take more risk with your portfolio, you want to hold more risks. If you want to take less risk, then you want to hold more bonds. But when you take less risk, there are also less reward, meaning potential for higher returns. Take a look at the following chart from the Bogleheads Guide to Investing. This chart shows maximum annual loss and the average annual return an investor would have incurred during the period between 1926 and 2012 based upon various stock to bond allocation. If you were to have been 100% in stocks, though your average returns would have been highest at 10%, at your worst year, your portfolio would have lost 43% of its value. Imagine you're about to retire and your portfolio is dipped by almost half its value. You either need to push back your retirement or have a heart attack, or maybe a combination of both. Now imagine that you're very risk averse, so you decided to go 100% bond. Now, so you're protected from the worst annual loss to 8%, but your average return is only 5.5%. By being so risk averse, you miss out on much of the gains from the market by having an overly conservative portfolio. Or worse, it can also push you to sell during a stock market downturn, simply to avoid further losses, which could mean you miss out on the gains when the stocks that you have sold rebounds. The bottom line is that buy and hold strategy works, but only if we can overcome our bias of loss aversion and avoid our own self from getting in the way. Thank you guys for watching. If you'd like to learn more about what specific funds to implement in your buy and hold strategy, please check out following videos here. Until next time, all the best.